afternoon, good morning, good evening, colleagues uh, from wherever you are. Welcome to this invited guest lecture series of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology at the University of Pretoria. Uh, this will be the last of our series uh, of us here. Uh, and before I introduce uh, Prof. Eddie Odell, just a few housekeeping rules. You'll see that all of you have been muted. So please make sure that your videos is switch off as well. It is said that you'll talk around about just under, just short of an hour. And if you have any questions, we will address them via the chat function uh, and he will address them thereafter. Uh, with that being said, uh, I think we are indeed fortunate that we have somebody of Eddie's statue to end this year uh, for us of, on our series. He needs hardly any introduction, but uh, as you know, he's uh, currently professor uh, of oral pathology and medicine at uh, King's College London, and also honorary consultant in his pathology guys and St. Thomas. Uh, he's also the previously clinical lead for head and neck pathology. It is, uh, participate in many, many congresses, given uh, invited guest uh, talks, always of higher standard. He is uh, the current past president of the IAOP, numerous publications to his uh, CV, and he has written and edited five textbooks as well. And as he said, he's just busy with the latest revision of Corson's uh, book, which all of us are using. Uh, he's also an editorial board of many pathology journals. Uh, he's been an author for the 2005 to 2017, as well as the 2022 WHO Blue Book on head and neck tumors. Uh, we also, on the last one, serve on the editorial board uh, for the WHO uh, edition. He's also led to international collaboration on cancer reporting data set for odontogenic tumors. His uh, research interest varies on molecular changes in dysplasias, plays a role significant in uh, DNA ploidy analysis of, uh, for the prediction of molecular transformation of dysplastic lesions. Eddie, thank you for agreeing uh, to address us this afternoon. We're looking forward to your presentation and over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Can you see me? We can see you. We haven't seen, can't see your screen yet. No, that's all right. I will share my screen. Perfect. Thank you. How's that looking? Well, thank you very much, Willie, for your kind introduction and for asking me to talk in your series. It's been an excellent series of talks. I haven't been able to make all of them myself, but uh, you've had some great talks. And uh, one of the nice things about them is that we've got a, an informed audience, so we can have some interesting discussion at the end, I hope. Um, going to talk to everybody today about dysplasia. And I've spoken about this recently at other conferences, and I don't want to churn out the same old talk. So I'm going to, some of it's the same, but I want to try and be a little bit more informal and a bit more um, discursive about the problems of dysplasia. Um, if you miss anything, uh, I have published a couple of papers recently back in 2021 with colleagues, as you can see on the screen, uh, where I've got references. I've tried to put the PubMed numbers in. They're the quickest thing to write down if you're watching. You just jot down the PubMed number to take you straight to those. And also um, the third edition of NEPS uh, Diagnostic Pathology book. Uh, I contributed to the first chapter in that as well. So a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about are also covered in those references where you will find uh, further references. So what is dysplasia? You think that would be easy to answer, but it's not. Um, it basically means abnormal growth, but of course, we also need to think about differentiation in oral lesions. So I think abnormal growth and differentiation caused by genetic alterations. Um, does it have to be visible histologically to be dysplasia? I think probably not, but what we see are changes in 
genes that relate to structural proteins and the structure of cells. We don't see all the changes in the signaling proteins and the things that are going on in the background. The other thing that's important to remember about dysplasia is that it's often of no significance. Whilst it carries a risk of malignant transformation, most dysplastic lesions never go malignant. The WHO definition is at the bottom, and that's the one that will be in the new classification, which is now available online and due out uh, on paper early next year. We know that the genetic changes in dysplasia are really marked. Here's just a, a small little bit of the genome, three chromosomes picked out here. Uh, and each of the vertical lines of colored dots is a separate dysplastic lesion that we've looked at. And you can see that the, there are holes all over the genome, either amplifications or deletions or areas of copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. And these are often quite continuous large chunks of chromosome. So the genetic changes in dysplasia are really uh, very marked. Um, if you try and put this all together, uh, in a longitudinal system, it's quite difficult to find biopsies of lesions that have progressed. But uh, here's one that we did a few years back. And you can see that in early dysplasia, if we look at these genes clustering in what we called early dysplasia, that is on the time of first biopsy, the number of genes altered is relatively small. But even just about three or four years later, in the same lesion, many more genes have been affected and they're starting to cluster together in areas that we recognize as being related to malignant transformation. And if we go on to look again, another few years later than that, the number of genes seems to go up uh, at a fairly steady linear rate in dysplasias. Uh, and by these are between five and eight years after first biopsy, we have about 6,000 genes altered in, in any one dysplastic lesion. So the genome is really abnormal. But this progression has been used to put together um, theories of progression of dysplasia into cancer that I'm going to talk about first. This is um, from Califano. Uh, not surprisingly, these are modeled on the colon uh, adenoma carcinoma sequence. And you still find diagrams like this uh, in many textbooks and papers. Um, the problem is that I, I don't think this is really correct. First of all, it implies that lots of dysplastic lesions are all going to end up as carcinomas. And secondly, we don't really have good evidence that this is actually a progression. Uh, many of these models in the literature use the word hyperplasia, which is completely wrong. These early visible stages are not hyperplastic. Um, that's a, a response to a stimulus that is reversible. They are, uh, if you look in these hyperplastic lesions, they have genetic changes. So these are irreversible. They're just milder cases of dysplasia. Uh, so why do these, these models came about based on the ideas of the progressive uh, mutation model that was built up around, mostly around the colon adenoma carcinoma sequence, but have really been around almost since, since, the nine, since about 1960. In this little cartoon here of the epithelium, you can see the Ritti process pattern. And there are stem cells in the epithelium, the oral epithelium, just as there are in the epidermis, there's about one stem cell in the bottom of each Ritti process, which gives rise to a clone of cells above it. This is called the epidermal proliferative unit. The daughter cells that are produced by the stem cells are the transient amplifying cells. And if we make genetic changes in any of these cells, either the stem cells or the transient amplifying cells, we have self-perpetuating genetic changes because these cells are all in cycle and they may be permitted to continue to be in cycle by the genetic changes that are made. Now, if some carcinogens hit the epithelium, there are a number of factors that you can see listed down the bottom that affect the, uh, how those carcinogens act, but basically they will damage the DNA in the cells and some cells will be damaged but terminally differentiating, and those are simply going to die. But some cells will remain able to proliferate and they will divide and they will give rise to small clones of cells. 
Now, in all these diagrams I'm showing you, this is a cart theoretical cartoon. The size of these clones isn't really known, but certainly initially they're going to be relatively small, just one epidermal proliferative unit. Now, in the older theories of dysplasia, the idea was that some of these mutations would give rise to a growth advantage and that certain clones of cells would be fitter to uh, divide than others and that those clones would gradually take over the epithelium and they would spread possibly even throughout the mouth to form areas of field change. Then when some more carcinogens come along and new clones form, those clones would either be outcompeted or they would have additional advantages and that clone would eventually replace the original clone and so on until eventually you get a clone which picks up the final straw that breaks the camel's back, the last mutation necessary, which turns the, uh, turns the dysplasia into a carcinoma by allowing it to invade. Now, that's an interesting model, except that we know that it's not necessarily correct. Uh, it may be correct for some lesions, and although we don't like this overall for most dysplastic lesions, it has some advantages, which we'll come to in a minute. All those old theories are based on cross-sectional data. Although they show progressions from one lesion to another, uh, very few studies actually have longitudinal samples. And longitudinal samples are difficult to analyze because of course the piece that you're looking at has been removed from the patient. And you don't know whether it's truly progressing or whether you're just looking at multiple samples of the same thing. But if we look using more modern techniques with smaller samples, we know that dysplastic lesions are actually very heterogeneous. There are lots of different clones in them. And the new model is one of evolutionary stasis. That is, all these clones evolve in the epithelium and they just sit there. They are stable rather than advancing. We know that there's a lot more dysplasia than cancer, so dysplasia in most patients must be a stable uh, situation. And there's very good evidence for that in the skin that we'll come to in a minute. Um, we know that lots of the mutations that you get in dysplasia are shared in cancers. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all those mutations are contributing to cancer uh, or that they're necessarily very significant. So how do we think cancers do uh, arise in dysplasia? We know that oral cancers are very molecularly diverse. They all have very different genetic changes. And there are not that many driver genes that are actually responsible for progression uh, in oral squamous cell carcinoma. Um, we know that there's a lot of shared genetic change between the dysplasias and the cancers. But what we think now is that the cancers arrive in the dysplasia, but rather than by progression from it, which is a slightly difficult concept to understand. But basically, we're suggesting that in dysplasias, there are driver genes that make the dysplasia survive, but they don't necessarily drive the cancers that arise in the dysplasias. Similarly, there are driver genes in cancers which if they were in the dysplasia would not have the same effect at all. The environment, the genetic environment in which these changes are acting are all different. We tend to think now that many cancers arrive in a big bang. They are a sudden random reassociation of chromosomes, either chromothripsis or chromoplexy, the shattering and, and re- uh, uh, re-annealing of chromosomes or um, multiple uh, fragmentation of chromosomes. So sudden events which are thought to be random. Uh, one of the really good studies on dysplasia, uh, which came out a few years ago now and which um, I've been presenting the results from for a while, I think is really important paper. Uh, it's uh, in Cell Death and Discovery by Makareff and colleagues. And I can see some of his colleagues are uh, logged on to this meeting. So it might be interesting to talk about. It's an in silico study. There are, there's no tissue analysis here. It's all been done based on sequence analysis uh, from the uh, GEO database. They got together oral cancers, dysplastic lesions, normal mucosa, 
and they analyzed a very complex uh, exome analysis to look at the pathways that were involved in individual dysplastic lesions. They had 68 precursor lesions analyzed. And when they looked at the pathways in those lesions, only, although 20 of those had genetic changes that looked very much like cancers, they were only dysplasias. And of those, only seven progressed to cancer across six years. And dysplastic lesions were able to progress to cancer without developing any cancer-like molecular changes in their earliest stages. And the authors of that study and also the Wood papers that I was showing on the previous side, have all, they're all in agreement that there's no predictable molecular pathway from a dysplasia to a cancer. And they also suggested that carcinomas arise in dysplasia, but not necessarily from them. Now, this study does have a lot of provisos and there are some problems. It's a very, it's very complex methodology, but the results are so striking that even if there are problems with it, the, the, the message um, is, is quite clear. This is a graph from that paper and it shows signaling pathways in cancer. Each of these across the bottom here is a, a signaling pathway in cancer. And we have a line that shows the normal control level of activation of each of those signaling pathways. And what's very striking is that carcinomas tend to have activated signaling pathways, as you would expect, but that most dysplasias have signaling pathways that are downregulated. So these are not really sort of cancers in waiting, they're actually rather inhibited. These are the five main pathways that are involved in oral cancer. And you might think, well, if all these dysplastic lesions have their cancer signaling pathways um, inhibited, uh, how on earth are we ever going to make a cancer out of a dysplasia? But uh, if you just look at those main cancer pathways, you'll see that the cancers are all activated, but some of the dysplasias don't actually have much reduction. I think there's always space for new genetic events upstream to bypass the inhibitory changes or for new genetic changes downstream to make the ones in the dysplasia redundant. So you can still make a carcinoma out of a dysplasia, but most of the dysplasias are just sitting in the tissue with inhibitory genetic changes. So there's a new model which fits with this, which has basically come out of colon, uh, but also works to a degree in skin, the evolutionary model and the punctuated equilibrium theory. Now, this theory is a bit different. It has to account for all those dysplasias that don't progress. When the carcinogens hit the epithelium, the clones are formed in the same way as before, but many of them probably stay fairly small. P53 alterations are very common in early dysplasia. And we know from skin that those clones that have certain P53 mutations, but not all of them, have the ability to spread within the epithelium. But just having a P53 mutation alone doesn't necessarily give it that ability. And the clones that form are all deficient. Their genetic signaling pathways are inhibited, and they're going to rely on cells in other clones. And the the cells may rely on other clones of cells for growth signaling or nutrients or other advantages, or they may even rely on normal cells being interspersed with them. So the genetic cell, the net genetically altered cells are, uh, might even disappear if the, uh, perhaps if a patient stops smoking. <clears throat> so dysplasia is now regarded as an evolutionary process. And these clones are thought to gradually expand sometimes by developing new mutations. But most of the mutations in the dysplasia are passenger mutations. That is, they're just sitting there, not exerting much effect. Many of them are synonymous, which means the mutation is, it's a mutation, but it's still encoding the same amino acid as the, uh, as the wild type, they could be non-coding, they could be in non-expressed genes. And a lot of the genetic damage is generated by what's called neutral dynamics. It's just happening, ticking over in the background, and it's not actually a process of genetic selection. So just because these clones 
carry their passenger mutations forward into any cancer that develops from them doesn't mean that any of those mutations were necessarily important in developing the cancer. So back to that message again, dysplasia is not progressing to cancer, it's generating a sort of bubbling cauldron of genetically abnormal cells that are prone to random future uh, huge genetic events uh, on mitosis, which could convert them into a cancer. And that process is random and rapid. So looking at dysplasias to try and work out how they become cancers is going to be extremely difficult. So let's see what we know about the clonal structure in dysplasias. Um, this is the earliest study I know because I, I met the author. This is a PhD uh, thesis from Cardiff University back in 1993. Uh, and it was done in animal study. A lot of this work is still done in animal, um, particularly in mouse NQO model. There are still nice new papers coming out this year on this model showing how similar it is to oral cancer uh, from a group here at King's with, under Fiona Watt. But this uh, was uh, a model uh, of a mouse which is, has glucose 6-phosphate uh, isoenzymes which are uh, X-linked and uh, randomly lionized. So mutagen carcinogens were applied to the epithelium and you can see loss of an isotype and you can see a little clone of cells here in which the gene has been damaged. So you can see that the first clones are going to be quite small. This is some work done by Zareza Zani in our department. We took a panel of 10 uh, probes for different parts of the genome. They were partly selected on the basis of being important in cancer. Some of them were just chromosomal markers. And we put these onto dysplastic lesions. These are dysplastic basal cells in a, in a lesion. This is the basement membrane running along here. And this just shows two probes one for a specific uh, locus, and one is a uh, telomeric, uh, is a chromosome 11 specific probe. And you can see that one probe, we get more or less two signals per cell, that's pretty normal. But that for the other probe, there are multiple copies of uh, that locus in all these cells. And we, in general, we expect amplifications in dysplasias. They tend to have many more amplifications than deletions. And that's because cells that develop many deletions uh, die, uh, but those that have applications tend to survive. And when we do our ploidy analysis, we find that virtually all dysplasias are associated with amplified chromosome segments. And you can also see that there are cells in here that don't seem to be abnormal in terms of their copy number of these two loci. And Zareza spent many happy hours at a fluorescence microscope counting the fluorescent dots. And I can just show you a very small part of a huge series of results here. Each of these is a, a dysplastic lesion, each of these little bar charts. And we, these are the copy numbers for the various loci. Here are two, one on chromosome eight, one on chromosome 11. If we want to be certain that the cells are aneuploid and dysplastic, we're looking for copy number counts of five or more. They could, if they were preparing for mitosis, have a double the amount of DNA and more copies of the gene. And a normal diploid cell would be green. And for these two loci, it's striking how variable the number of abnormal cells in a dysplastic lesion is. Some are completely normal for these loci. And in some, the number of abnormal cells is very, very high. And these were just counting the basal and the suprabasal cells. Um, so everything in a short stretch of the dysplastic lesion. Now, if we looked at other markers in the same cells, we might find that there were other markers that were aneuploid in this lesion. And uh, so that we're only looking at a small number of, um, of markers here. But the message seems to be that many of these clones contain lots of normal cells. And some of them do seem to be quite small. Here's a dysplastic lesion, which is keratinized. It's got early premature keratinization. A little bit of, you can just about make out the loss for early uh, discohesion here. And if you sample three areas to do these fish analysis on and analyze them separately, we know that overall the lesion is aneuploid because on the DNA analysis, you can see there's a stem 
population here with an abnormal DNA content. And you look just in those three areas, if we look at just the data for the EGF gene, each side of a little half millimeter area, the cells are normal with two copies per cell, but there's huge EGFR amplification just for half a millimeter. So that suggests that the clone here is about a half a millimeter in diameter and probably quite stable despite that apparent growth advantage. It's worth looking at skin. There's a lot of interesting work coming out from skin and it turns out to be similar to oral dysplasia in many ways. Uh, throughout skin, we all have patches of these P53 immunopositive uh, areas. Uh, these are not visible clinically, but in some exposed skin, there are little clusters of cells that are, have the P50, have P53 mutations. This is skin looked at from the basal aspect, from underneath, and these are immunohistochemistry for cells with P53 mutation. And these small patches of cells are very extensive. If this is 3D reconstructed into a transverse view, the uh, resolution drops a little bit. This is the basement membrane here, and this is the keratinized surface. And each of these bright dots is a cell with a P53 mutation. You can see that there's a clone here of cells, of, of uh, the, the amplifying cells or stem cells at the bottom, which are clustered together, but that there are P53 mutation positive cells which gradually spread out in the epithelium and probably account for the lateral spread of some of these clones. Depends on their P53 mutation. Now these P53 patches in skin are very, very frequent and they're rather like uh, the patches of oral mucosa that you can sample and find uh, DNA abnormalities in, even though you can't prove that they're aneuploid. Um, each of the clones in skin is relatively small, 60 to 3,000 cells. Now, of course, this is sun-induced. These are to do with thymidine dimers in P53. It's not the nasty mix of carcinogens that we have, but it shows that clone size is under control and that the normal cells each side are, if you like, fighting back and keeping these, these, the clone size under growth control. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to know that you could have up to 4% of your epidermis affect by, affected by these little patches of P53 mutated skin, which can escape their normal patch boundaries. We, we call the normal clone size uh, in uh, epithelium a patch, which is unfortunate because that word is used for other things as well. But the clones can grow to escape their patch size. So this means that the old theory of cancer development, the spread of clones can certainly happen. And when you look at the MACAREF study, which has looked at all those inhibited dysplasias, the numbers are relatively small. And although some of those lesions have been associated with carcinoma, we don't know if they have actually progressed into carcinoma. So the two theories, the two clonal theories are not inconsistent with one another. Staying in the skin for a moment, these are those P53 mutated patches. Actually, their patches are more than P53 mutated. About 60% of these genetically altered patches have P53 mutations. That's the second row on this graph. They also have alterations in lots of other cancer signaling genes. So I think mean, these are very similar to the earliest changes that are going on in the mouth. How do we recognize dysplasia? Well, I guess what most people do is they turn to that table in the WHO book. And here we have the, the table that's going to be in the new edition when it comes out in 2020. Uh, a huge amount of discussion about what would go into this with the authors of the dysplasia section. Um, I've highlighted in yellow things which are new. Most of them are really not new at all. It's just that they haven't been put into the table in quite the same words before. Um, you'll see that the first thing is that there are many more architectural features. The WHO classification last time round accepted that dysplasia could be uh, characterized by only architectural features, but that has not really 
uh, got the emphasis that it deserves. And we wanted to add in more features of architectural displays here into the table. Uh, we moved a couple of things across into cytological because they're really to do with single cells. Um, basal cell clustering and nesting is, I'll show you in a minute, is an abnormality of growth that is, must be really important because it shows that cells are losing the uh, growth control of making them differentiate and move upwards in the epithelium. They're tending to cluster and grow downwards. Um, an expanded proliferative compartment was a, a form of words that we ended up with after a lot of discussion. Uh, in the older tables, we used to have the expression basal cell hyperplasia. And that is still used in many um, academic papers on dysplasia. But basal cell hyperplasia is not a feature of dysplasia. By definition, hyperplasia is not dysplasia. And if people use that expression to tie up both increased mitotic activity and increased number of layers of cells that look like basal cells. So we've converted that into expanded proliferative compartment. I often call it expanded basaloid compartment. This is very important. It's been around in the literature for a long time, but generalized premature keratinization. In the previous tables, that was understood in expressions like abnormal keratinization, but that was a very woolly phrase that didn't really explain. So we now have generalized premature keratinization. Also important is the alteration by subsite. And we've added in specific verrucous and papillary architectures because those weren't there. And yet we all know that verrucous dysplasias have a high chance of undergoing malignant transformation. Extension along minor gland ducts has been recognized for decades. I'm not sure why it wasn't in the list. And this is an important one, sharply defined margins. This is a reflection of the clonal structure of the dysplasia. You can often see histologically where a clone finishes the dysplasia stops very abruptly. We know that in skin and in colon, having multiple different clones in a lesion gives it a higher risk. So multiple different patterns of dysplasia and multifocal and skip lesions have been added into the architectural features. Apoptotic mitosis is uh, turning out not to be very popular with a lot of people. What we mean, what I wanted to put in here was spontaneous apoptoses. That is cells within the epithelium undergoing apoptosis without being associated with lymphocytes. So not a lichenoid process, but simply undergoing spontaneous apoptosis because they are genetically abnormal. It will be a sign of chromosomal instability and genetic damage. That's not in the literature, so it wasn't allowed into the table, but there has been some mention of apoptotic mitosis, and so that's what went in. That's just a cell that's undergoing apoptosis where you can still see chromosomes organized as if they're on a metaphase plate. You have to distinguish it from karyorexis. I don't think anyone's really happy with that, but I think spontaneous apoptosis is important. I would have loved to have put lichenoid immune response into the table because this table is too focused on the epithelium. And we know that this early dysplasias are already interacting and signaling with the underlying connective tissue. And I regard a lichenoid immune response as part of a dysplasia. Between 40 and 60% of oral dysplastic lesions have what looks like lichen planus immune host response against it. And until we get people to recognize that, we will never stop misdiagnosing dysplastic lesions as lichen planus. So here's some of those features. Here's an abrupt margin, the edge of a clone. Both sides of this lesion are dysplastic but you can see a sharp margin running down here between two clones. On one side, we have a pattern which is characterized by early keratinization, single cell keratinization, uh, early loss of cohesion or discohesion of cells, the development of polarity of basal cells. I would have liked to have put that in as a feature, but it's not sufficiently in the literature. Uh, 
And on the other side, we have a completely different pattern where there is expansion of the basaloid compartment, not much in the way of mitotic activity and not much in the way of individual cytological atypia. That's a nice example of sharp margins. Here are budding and subdividing reti processes. Uh, we know that these are uh, measures of a uh, poor prognosis growth pattern in cancers. Well, they're a marker of a bad prognosis growth pattern in a dysplastic lesion. That's a very mild change. But when you see cells clustering like this, they almost look like melanocytes in in situ melanoma. Uh, they're growing little clones of cells. They don't know which way to go. They're just growing in little balls. That's a very worrying feature. And I would have no hesitation in calling a lesion like this a severe dysplasia, even though it only has this change limited to the basal third. Note also the loss of cohesion and early keratinization in that lesion. Verrucous architecture, well, there are lots of lesions that have a little bit of peaking or um, some early smoke, smoking changes with uh, chevrons and so on. So I think if you're going to call something verrucous, you have to have a proper verrucous pattern. And this is a proper verrucous pattern at its earliest stages. I think there's definite spiking of the surface keratin and it lines up with the uh, connective tissue papillae which tend to be just up underneath the spires, and we're retaining a flat basement membrane. So this is starting to become verrucous. I would call that verrucous, but if it's less than that, I would probably not flag that as dysplastic. Here are some spontaneous apoptoses. It's not always easy to see if they were mitotic or not, but I don't think it really matters. I think if you have cells like this undergoing apoptosis, without any lymphocytes around that could be killing them in a, in a lichenoid type process, this indicates genetic damage. And so I would count that as a feature of dysplasia. Now, there have been many studies looking at which features might be important going right back to the 1970s. And here's a recent one that's come out of uh, Sheffield. Uh, and they've come up with a list of features out of 109 lesions. But this is really, really difficult. We know that different dysplasias look different. And if you come up with a feature that's only present in a small number of lesions, it could be that it's very important in a few or not so important in a lot because you average out a lot of the changes. I agree that these are important changes. Bulbous reti pegs show lateral growth. Hyperchromatism shows an abnormal amount of DNA in the cell. Loss of epithelial cohesion is part of losing structure of the epithelium. Uh, suprabasal mitosis indicates uh, um, an in increased number of cells in cycle. If cancer develops through chromatripsis and these sort of catastrophic events, they're all associated with cell division. So if dysplastic lesions have no mitoses in them, I'm really not as worried about them. But if something looks not too worrying, but has a lot of mitotic activity, I count that as quite an important feature. And a nuclear pleomorphism, I think if it's combined with hyperchromatism, definitely that's a feature of abnormal DNA content in the cells. But lots of these studies have been done, but if you're going to do this, you have to look at the, which features are important in different patterns of dysplasia, and that hasn't really been done yet. I'll come back to that because we all recognize that there are lots of different spectra of dysplasia. Some of them are uh, architectural only. Some are, uh, if you like, basaloid or classical patterns with lots of um, thirds of the epithelium uh, affected. Uh, there are lots of different reti process patterns. Some of them have uh, no keratin on them at all. And then we have the immune response. So we have all these different spectrums of appearances within dysplasia. We can't expect to throw them all into a study and discover what is uh, the most important feature. One of the interesting uh, things that's being sort of rediscovered at the moment is architectural dysplasia. This is a small carcinoma arising in a dysplastic lesion. And if you go back to the 1970s and 80s, there are lots of papers explaining how cancers can arise in what was called normal epithelium or mild dysplasia. But this epithelium at the edge, this is not 
normal or mild dysplasia. This is dysplastic. This is just an architectural or differentiated or keratinizing pattern of dysplasia, which is often not appreciated. Um, the concept of differentiated dysplasia is being championed at the moment by the group in Amsterdam uh, with Elizabeth Blamina. Um, not sure she's been on some of these talks, she might be with us, uh, and also um, pathologists in Belgium and also recently in Korea. This is based on a concept that comes from dysplasia in the vulva, where dysplasia is divided into two patterns, classic and differentiated. The classic type is HPV associated and there is expansion of the basal cell compartment through up through the thicknesses, the sort of CIM123 pattern, um, and that's very easy to recognize. But pathologists looking at vulval dysplasia have started to recognize or recognize over about the last eight or nine years that they've been missing a lot of dysplasia because it's what they call differentiated. Uh, it has a basal layer of small cells, um, suprabasal cells that are very eosinophilic, uh, intercellular edema, uh, it's hyperplastic or flat. Now, these are the features of architectural dysplasia in the mouth. Small basal cells, okay, no uh, anisonucleosis or hyperchromatism, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, well, that's premature keratinization. Intercellular edema is not intercellular edema, it's this early loss of cohesion that prickle cells show in dysplasia. And this is acanthosis and not developing a reti process pattern. So this is different, this differentiated dysplasia is very common in the mouth. And um, I know Bruce, if Bruce is still on, the, on this uh, call, hasn't got bored, Bruce used to divide laryngeal dysplasia into basaloid and spinous in a similar way, a uh, very sensible way of dividing it because they look so different. And uh, all dysplasia in the mouth and in the larynx, I think is differentiated. We have hardly any HPV associated dysplasia in the mouth. We might talk about those later. So this classical pattern we do see, but it's it's often mixed in with a differentiated pattern. Most oral dysplasia is differentiated. An interesting pattern which has been proposed to identify this is that keratin 13 is lost and keratin 17 is increased. Uh, I have no experience of this. I haven't tried it yet except on a few cases. I'm not so happy about the site of keratin 13 because that can be disturbed when you have a, an immunological host response. But cytokeratin 17 is interesting because it's associated with developmental processes and has some other interesting functions that might make that worth looking at. Uh, this is one of the papers from the Amsterdam group showing their two classical types of classical dysplasia and differentiated dysplasia. And certainly, if you were to look at that and say that that looked a bit like an HPV dysplasia, I wouldn't argue with you. I might well consider doing uh, HPV investigations on a dysplasia that looked like this. But we don't very often see full thickness basaloid expansion in the oral cavity. There's always some keratin on the surface, uh, e even in HPV dysplasia. There's, there's quite a lot. Um, so I think all dysplasias are differentiated, it's just a matter of degree. Here's their nice example from their paper with lots of keratin, small inconspicuous basal cells, premature keratinization. Difficult to recognize as dysplasia. If you're not a specialist and you don't look at oral dysplasia a lot, you may not appreciate that that is a dysplastic, dysplastic lesion. If you'd like to look up the story of differentiated dysplasia, it starts in Switzerland with the recognition that it was a frequent, uh, frequently associated with oral carcinomas. Uh, two nice papers from the Amsterdam group and also one from, um, from Korea, which uh, nicely shows, this goes back to what was done with the arsenic and Cura paper, looking at carcinomas and their preceding lesions, which had previously been thought to be mild or low grade. So I think there's a lot of people turning down their threshold for detecting dysplasia, because if you just have a biopsy like this and you can't see a sharp clonal margin, 
Um, and it's not in a patient who is a risk patient. You have to be rather brave to diagnose that as dysplasia. Is a mild dysplasia. And these are the sorts of things that we often see in consultation cases that have been missed prior to cancers. Differentiated dysplasias are often slightly mixed. Here's a differentiated dysplasia or an architectural dysplasia that also has some budding basal cells, a little bit of expansion of the basal compartment, some spontaneous apoptosis, a little bit of uh, polarity of basal cells. So how are we going to grade a dysplasia which has almost no cytological atypia in it? I think that you have to call this at least moderate and possibly severe dysplasia because the changes that we see here indicate uh, aneuploidy, DNA damage, and a worrying growth pattern. So this should be a severe dysplasia, even though the number of thirds of epithelium affected by basal cells is very small. Uh, I think I'm talking too slowly. Let me just see, yes. When you do get a host immune response to a differentiated dysplasia, it's very difficult to diagnose. You lose the basal cell layers. You start to get some proliferative reaction to the destruction of the host cells. And these are the lesions which are characteristically misdiagnosed as lichen planus, when actually this is just an architectural dysplasia with an immune reaction. These are the papers from um, the Amsterdam group, dividing differentiated and classical dysplasia. Developing cancer, when the line drops, a patient develops cancer. And they showed in one paper that the differentiated dysplasia took slightly longer, but carried about the same risk. And in another paper, it was not quite so worrying, more about, I think, where I would put a moderate dysplasia. These are both nice studies, they're well carried out, and they've got a good long time course. How should we grade dysplasia, and is it worthwhile? Every paper you read says they use the WHO system, but there isn't really a system. The WHO gives you a table and it gives you some clues, but there is no validated system for grading dysplasia. The features are all a bit nonspecific, especially the architectural ones, and it's their number and combination. So it's very difficult to define exactly what constitutes dysplasia. What the WHO says, which was important this time and in 2017, was that these differentiated or architectural dysplasias uh, can be just architectural and still constitute dysplasia. It also says that judging the number of thirds is a feature that you can take into account. That's much more popular in the America, in North America than it is in Europe. But um, don't get carried away with thirds. It's useful if a dysplastic lesion has basal compartment expansion, then the more cells there are which are in cycle, the more worrying it certainly is. So it's a factor. But this all oversimplifies the complexity of grading. And basically, you can have a whole range of appearances that are dysplasia. It's your professional judgment about how abnormal this is. How abnormal is its growth, its growth pattern, its mitotic activity, its what's, what is the likelihood of genetic damage. And that professional judgment requires a few years of experience. And it's done differently around the world. One of the interesting things about the WHO process is that we talk to people all around the world and the ways in which dysplasia is graded around the world are very, very different. So are these unanswered questions? We need, I think these are obvious. This is a rhetorical question. Yes, of course, we need separate grading systems for different appearances of dysplasia. Verrucous lesions we know, which is, this is just a subtype of what I prefer to call architectural, but uh, basaloid, conventional. I, I like architectural and conventional because I think we have had those in the oral uh, dysplasia terminology for many years. Uh, I don't like calling it differentiated because pathologists, particularly those who aren't specialists in the mouth or upper aerodigestive tract, are going to think that all the other basaloid ones are HPV associated, which they're not. But the, this group, 
clearly needs a different grading system from those with basaloid compartment expansion. Uh, and we don't have a system for HPV associated dysplasia when we do see it. But yes, we need a different grading system. Number one for people who are not used to grading in the mouth is to recognize the variation in the oral mucosa. You have to compare what's happening in the dysplastic tissue with the normal tissue at the site. These are all normal oral mucosa and I've stretched the pictures to show them at the same magnification. You can see how different they all look. And if you were a pathologist who wasn't used to looking in the mouth and you read that list of WHO features, you could look at some of the normal epithelium and start to worry that it was dysplastic. So you have to know your regional variations in the mouth. This is what I do. I go, I don't grade half a millimeter at the margin because it often becomes hyperchromatic. There's a reaction to trauma, which very quickly makes a small zone hyperchromatic. I think about the normal for the mouth. I think about thirds, but I don't worry too much about it. I looked, I look for anything that has severe cytological atypia because that means abnormal DNA content and chromosomal instability. So that's always going to be severe. I look for the growth pattern. Is it budding, growing sideways, growing downwards? Downward growth in the skin is an important feature for predicting malignant transformation. We don't often talk about it in the mouth. I look at the Reti processes, are they bulbous? Traditional bulbous Reti processes are always moderate dysplasia to me. I look for mitotic activity and apoptoses. I go for hyperchromatism because that's DNA content by another name. I look for premature keratinization, sharp lateral margins, and the discohesion as features of uh, the arc of architectural features. And anything which is truly verrucous is automatically worth one grade. There are no verrucous lesions that are not dysplastic if you exclude a few things like uh, verruciform xanthoma. But papilloma, apart from that, anything that's verrucous is by and large dysplastic. Anything that goes down a salivary duct is automatically severe. I think most people have done that for decades. And if there's candida in it, I try and avoid grading it, but I might take a grade off if the features are consistent with candida, if they're the same features that I would see in a pure candidal lesion, proliferation, the reti morphology. But otherwise, uh, if there's hyperchromatism, anisonucleosis, abnormal growth pattern, those are things which are not caused by candida. Does dysplasia grading work? Once you can recognize it, you're most of the way there because you can flag to a clinician that a patient has a risk lesion. Uh, there are many pessimistic papers in the literature that say that oral dysplasia grading doesn't work, it's not reproducible, it's rubbish. I mean, come on, there are lots of authors on this. We, we, why do we keep writing such negative papers? Here's dysplasia larynx and oral cavity, two studies. The, what, this no, is no longer the biggest study on the right, but it was when I made this slide recently. These are stretched out to be on the same axes. Look how much better we are at predicting cancer with severe dysplasia in the mouth than in the larynx, where high-grade dysplasia is not even as bad as our moderate dysplasia. So look, we're really good at this, and we have to say so. If you go back in the literature, everybody used to think dysplasia was good. Then we've gone through a period of years where people have said, no, dysplasia grading is rubbish. It doesn't predict. Um, if you go to that paper, which I'll, I'll go back to the slide at the end and give you the PubMed reference, where uh, I pulled together all the big studies that had published their transformation by Kaplan Myers. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've had a lot of really good papers. And you can see in these graphs, the transformation rates for none, mild, moderate, and severe dysplasia in lots of different studies in large groups. Um, and you can see that by and large, these lines separate quite nicely. They don't in some, but that's because some of these studies have used slightly different methodologies looking at progression rather than transformation. Some of the studies that look best are including malignant transformation in six months. That's great because that's what the clinician wants to know. And those that exclude transformation with six months in order to avoid 
sampling error, they tell you what the natural history of the lesion is if you don't develop carcinoma in those first six months. It's rather different, but the grades are still significantly different. The other thing to look at in some of these studies is that you can get better results with your dysplasia grading when you have a low malignant transformation rate. If you have a very high transformation rate, you almost don't need to do the biopsy and grade the dysplasia because almost everybody gets cancer in the end. But even with a high transformation rate, you can still pick out different risk groups who could be treated differently. So this is great. I think that all these are explained in that paper. But many papers have a lot of difficulties that we've already discussed. It's easy to see why dysplasia grading gives bad results. Everybody who grades dysplasia has to uh, audit their results against their malignant transformation rate because that's the only way that you can improve. Now, I'm almost on time. I just like to have a quick run through. I'm going to skip some slides because the things that are always said that we're bad at are reproducibility. I don't know why we're all obsessed with reproducibility. You cannot assess biological systems reproducibly. And if you look at these nice papers from the 1990s, they'll explain to you why histological grading systems don't have to be that reproducible and why people always analyze them in the wrong way. And if you go to this nice paper that analyzes it in the right way, you'll find out that actually we're quite reproducible at grading dysplasia. And of course, you can get it wrong every time and be 100% reproducible, but you're not such a good pathologist. The other thing that's been talked about a lot recently is, is two grades better. Uh, in other body sites, everybody's going to two grades. What we want to do with dysplasia grading is to make those lesions which have none or mild dysplasia have very little transformation because then the clinicians can discharge these people from care after they watch them for six months or a year. And we want to detect the people who are going to get a cancer quickly and treat them aggressively and do more biopsies and look elsewhere in their upper aerodigestive tract. And we want to identify a group of people that we need to keep under review. Now, if you have a two grade system, you have to think about why is a two grade system theoretically, biologically plausible? Are these people in the middle group a mixture of, mild, of these ones and these ones, the severes and the milds, or are these an intermediate group? Now, I've shown you so many different spectrums of dysplasia and so many different grades. I think this middle group has to be part of a spectrum. It's actually a useful group to identify. And if you have a two grade system and you try and move these people out into the other groups, you take or some that you think are low grade out, you'll drag the low grade line down. And if you take the high grade ones out into the other group, you'll drag their line up. You now have a two grade system but you've sort of destroyed the clinical value of your grading system because now lots of people are going to get cancer in the end and you have lost the information that you were providing to the clinicians. And that's more or less what happens. This is uh, the, a paper recently publicized two grade system. You can see that that's more or less the pattern of the Kaplan-Meier graph. And if we go to other Kaplan-Meier published data from these studies, you'll see that it works for some people, but not for others. It probably depends how you do it, but these numbers of patients are much lower. So I don't think two grade systems are necessarily not as good. It depends how you do it, but we still don't have enough good studies. The data that we have though, mostly includes six month transformation, which gives the systems the best chance to show how good they would be and I don't think they're quite as good and in some of these the malignant transformation rates have been very high I think the original authors gave themselves a hard task with a 49 percent transformation it's often said that a two-grade system would help clinicians because it helps them decide whether to treat the patient but that's a bit of an insult because when you think of all the factors that affect whether a lesion undergoes malignant transformation, the clinician is going to take all these things into account. And what they want you to provide them with is the maximum amount of information. They don't need to be told whether to treat the patient or not. We don't know all these things, so we cannot possibly advise them on treatment by just giving them a dysplasia grade. 
Okay, Willie, I have reached a sort of natural break, so I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Well, uh, colleagues, uh, please you make use of this opportunity to in the chat function to type your questions and uh, let's see where we go. I think, Eddie, I don't know if you can see, but there's yep, uh, got... one from Liam Robinson. Right, carcinoma in situ. Good question. Um, the uh, we've been asked by several people, why has the WHO changed the classification and abolished carcinoma in situ? Um, the, the process of arriving at the WHO classification is interesting, complex and stressful. And we have at least managed to get the definition of dysplasia to be the same across our other sites. And uh, you'll see that carcinoma in situ is still accepted in the larynx for the pathologists who wish to flag up lesions that they feel are at the highest risk. Larynx is more difficult to review, and you may wish to write a report which gives uh, a sort of license for radiotherapy to carcinoma in situ. Now, in the mouth, we don't have that situation, but we haven't really changed carcinoma in situ for the mouth. The reason it has been taken out right back in the 2000 and the before 2017 one was because there were no good studies that showed that carcinoma in situ had a statistically different risk of malignant transformation from severe dysplasia. So they were simply merged together. And ever since that, I mean, we're talking probably 20 years ago, we've considered the two to be synonymous. Now, if you can define carcinoma in situ and you can separate them and show that they have a different outcome, I think we would go back to it. But there's a second problem, which is that the carcino the WHO would like to abolish uh, carcinoma in situ at all body sites. And the reason for that is because the concept is nonsense. It's either a carcinoma and it's invasive, or it's a dysplasia, which looks very nasty. And so there is basically no such thing as carcinoma in situ, whether it's in the breast, colon, you know, anywhere else, it doesn't exist. Now, that view is not international, and there's certainly some pushback, but that is where the WHO is heading. So I don't use the term. I don't find I need to use it in the mouth. I use it occasionally in the larynx. Uh, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you can define it, you can use it. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. I, I, I just uh, I, I agree for many years. I hate the term. I think, uh, as you say, it, it doesn't make sense. I used to say, if you can have uh, people that they miss the concept, if you can basically have, if you want to call them mild dysplasia, that is a carcinoma in situ already. So you, you cannot use, makes no sense for it to be severe and then starts infiltrating. No. So I, uh, I agree with you. Thanks. Uh, the next one from Cisco Marie, uh, if you can read that one there. Uh, uh, I've just clicked my exit full screen and lost it. Hang on. Let's go okay. Back. Uh, yeah, can read it I, out to I, me again. I just lost them for a second. Okay, I can read it to you again. Say thank you and ask how much emphasis do you place on clinical images of biopsy lesions with dysplasia in your practice? Um, I think they can be very useful when you're tracking things long term especially when dysplasias are mostly architectural, very useful in proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. We always like to see pictures. Sometimes we all sit around for, for dysplasias. We often all get together around a multi-header to talk about a grade. And then we get a picture up on the screen and we go, oh, right. Well, <laughs> we're not, we couldn't possibly call that a mild dysplasia in that context because we will be sending the wrong signal to the clinician, especially when lesions are extensive and they need to take more biops. So I think they're very useful, but I don't use the picture per se to help me grade, but I do want to know if we're dealing with a lesion in a, in a risk context, because some of those architectural dysplasias show 
very little change. But if I know I'm in an elderly patient who's been a smoker or an ex-smoker and that it's in a site that's not prone to friction and a risk one for cancer, I'll just call it mild dysplasia. That's not got any great connotations for the patient. So I think clinical information is very, very important. Um, and pictures can be useful and we like to see them when we can. Yeah. I don't know if you can see the chat now. Yeah, I've uh, got them back now, yeah. No, Nasser uh, is the next one. Uh, just go up. Uh, stromal inflammatory cells. Okay, so there's a lot of work going on on the interactions between late dysplasia, early invasion, stromal changes, myofibroblasts, and so on. Um, it's not a field that I'm expert in. Um, I I don't know how, how much this is important in driving a dysplastic lesion. If you think that dysplasias are predominantly inhibited, I tend to think of all the drivers coming from the chromosomal instability. Every time a cell divides in a dysplasia, that's when the new changes develop. Now, if, the, if there is stromal inflammation and that triggers proliferation, then that could act as a promoter. But things like uh, developing a myxoid change in your dermal papillae and developing myofibroblasts are very interesting, but I don't know uh, whether they should be taken into account. As I said, I wanted to put the immune response into being a feature of dysplasia. Uh, there may come a time when we put some stromal changes into features of dysplasia. That would be very interesting. Thanks, Eddie. And then uh, next question from Madhu. Hi, Madhu. Uh, nice to hear from you again. Uh, well, if you, you cannot grade dysplasia efficiently in the presence of candida. Now, it depends where you're working and on your surface, on your, how your service works, but basically we will issue a report that says that this is a dysplasia, probably it, they, we would perhaps say it's candidosis, possibly superimposed or probably superimposed on a dysplastic lesion and that the candida should be treated and then the biopsy retaken. We know that candida uh, tends to colonize abnormal epithelium. And so almost the presence of candida in something could be thought of as a worrying sign. And it depends on the changes that you see. When candida infects the epithelium, you tend to get those long parallel sided reti processes. You get suprapapillary atrophy, you get um, poorly organized flaky keratin, uh, increased mitoses, a little bit of basal compartment expansion. Now, some of those things are features of dysplasia, but there are lots of other features of dysplasia that aren't. And so I will look for those other features to try and write a report that says to the clinician, look, it's really important that you should treat the candida and get me another biopsy, or so that I can write them one that says, well, treat the candida and watch it, and just maybe take another biopsy if it changes. You, know, you can't, um, much of this is in mild or minimal dysplasia. You can't uh, have all these patients being treated for candida, and it's not always easy to completely treat and remove the candida. So uh, basically, I try and avoid giving a grade of dysplasia if candida is present. Thanks. Uh, and then from uh, Dr. Basu. Probably with your... Right, so, we, so we, we're very lucky here. We, we can do DNA ploidy analysis in the department. Uh, and so things that we're unsure of can have that. But uh, I, it doesn't correlate with dysplasia because if you have an architectural dysplasia, it might not have a lot of chromosomal instability. And so you don't detect it as aneuploid at all. Um, many of those mild and even some moderate dysplasias uh, cannot be detected as aneuploid using image-based or flow cytometry systems. Um, however, the value of the ploidy analysis is that it sometimes detects lesions that you haven't realized are dysplastic. And so they're really measuring two different things. So I don't worry that the two don't correlate. Um, if I just go back, um, I, at the end of the questions, I'll put up those three 
uh, references at the beginning. And one of those is an assessment of DNA ploidy analysis and uh, loss of heterozygosity. And it's explained in that paper. So I'll refer you to that. Thank you, Rinvis. Uh, congratulations from John and Bruce and Anna Luisa. And then a question from Suk. Uh, you're going to skip over HPV, or have I got different questions to you? Yeah, I think the next one is from Suk. Uh, that is. Oh, hi. Right. Hi, Suk. Uh, yes, I think that what we call architectural dysplasia is the equivalent of death, but I think all oral dysplasia is differentiated because it's not HPV. I mean, okay, there are a few HPV, but we've been collecting HPV for years and we're, we're struggling to get up towards 100. Um, and uh, we're you know, even, even putting out, uh, we've got a series joint with Newcastle, and I think Max and Selvam have got something over, over 100 cases. So I don't think it's uh, maybe a direct equivalent because the carcinogens genes are going to be different. Uh, but yes, it, these, it's just dysplasia. I just think that they haven't been recognizing that in the vulva. It's the same in anal canal and it's the same in, uh, in vagina and it's the same in the larynx and the upper area digestive tract. Uh, they, these are all uh, dysplasias of epithelia which are stratified and often keratinized and can be induced to keratinize even if they don't normally. So it's not surprising that they have this differentiated pattern. Why would you expect dysplasia to be non-differentiated? So I, I just take architecture as being directly equivalent to differentiated. Um, the WHO was, a, the, the publications were out when the WHO considered it, but they didn't want to introduce a new different term um, if it was felt that it was covered under architectural. But I can see that the concept of differentiated dysplasia will catch on amongst uh, medical pathologists because they're already familiar with it from other body sites. So and I, I'm not you know, averse to it. It's just another way of describing a set of changes. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Uh, I think the next question is free down from uh, Radhika. Right, yeah, okay. So submucous fibrosis, I, I simply regard all that early stage dysplasia in submucous fibrosis as architectural. And, uh, you know, the ones that you see where there's a premature keratinization, almost no change in the basal cells, uh, a host immune response. Although oddly, that often stands back a little bit from the epithelium. It might have some germinal centers, lymphoid follicles in it. Uh, I, I think they are, I call those mild architectural dysplasia. I don't, when I'm writing a report, I don't tell a clinician whether the dysplasia is architectural or classical, uh, or I just give them a grade. Um, but I would treat those early things in submucous fibrosis, which have often in the past been thought of as non-dysplastic or, or, or very mildly dysplastic or lichen planus like I just call those mild dysplasia. You know, the, the malignant transformation rate in mild dysplasia is extremely low. Uh, so once you know the patient has submucous fibrosis, that almost trumps any grade of dysplasia you give it. Uh, it may take a long time for the patient to develop malignant transformation, but there's no harm in calling these uh, mild dysplasia. All right, thanks, Eddie. That looks um, like that is all. A lot of people obviously saying thanks a lot. There was but, one further up just asked what grades for uh, HPV dysplasia. And I think that I haven't really that, talked about that. HPV dysplasia. H HPV dysplasia, I think, is different. Um, and so we don't grade it. Now, the malignant Trans, uh, HPV dysplasia is associated with oral squamous carcinoma, um, but the association is not nearly as well characterized. Uh, in our series, we have patients who have synchronous HPV dysplasia and cancers. We have ones that precede oral cancers, and we have ones that develop after the patient has cancer, uh, all sorts of different combinations. But the, the the association currently with us is at around 10%. Um, and I tend to regard it as probably equivalent to moderate dysplasia. And 
the number of cases continues to trickle in. It, it's not uh, anything like the epidemic of HPV associated uh, or a pharyngeal carcinomas, uh, but I, they, they look more basaloid, that, you know, they, they look different you need the special investigations to detect them. But once you detected them, we don't grade it. We just call it HPV carcinoma. Some of them, they all behave differently as well. Some of them just sit as little white patches in the mouth. Some of them resolve and some of them spread to cover wide areas like field change. So uh, we're very much still learning about HPV dysplasia in the mouth. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know, Eddie, if you can see any questions that was uh, that were directed to you specifically, because on my side, it looks like that covers everything. Oh, yes, that was a direct... Oh, it's the term on, uh, <laughs> the old term on lichenoid dysplasia uh, that came up, a question. Ah, oh, right, the, hor the horrible lichenoid dysplasia. Uh, okay, so... Um, <sighs> like... It, it, this is very much an age dependent question, isn't it? If you were around, I mean, I remember talking to the authors of the lichenoid dysplasia papers many, many years ago, probably before many of the people on this call were born. And uh, the idea of lichenoid dysplasia was a good idea. Um, it was going to separate out those that you were sure were dysplastic, those that you were sure were lichen planus, and you would have a dustbin category in the middle that you couldn't tell. And so you could give a, an uncertain report. But then it, everybody started to think that it was a disease, and then the criteria were too woolly. And after about 15 years, nobody liked it. And after about 20 or 25 years, we sort of abolished it. And I, I, I don't use the term at all. I think that dysplasias have a lichenoid immune response. It's part of their normal, uh, normal appearance. So why would you expect the body to ignore all these genetically abnormal cells sitting there on the surface. Of course, the immune system can recognize some of them and attack them, but it can't recognize all of them. Uh, so only a proportion have this response. Um, what is particularly difficult at the moment is that the concept has been reinvented clinically with the concept of lichenoid reaction. And there are a lot of papers about lichenoid reaction, which is doing exactly the same thing. This is the clinicians putting the definite lichen plainness into one basket and the definite dysplasias and calling everything else lichenoid reaction. And it's been suggested that those have a higher incidence of malignant transformation. Well, I'm sure they do. That's because they're all mild dysplasia that's been misdiagnosed as lichenoid reaction. These are architectural dysplasias, to my mind. But this is a relatively recent description, and it will take, you know, 10 years or so to for other centers to duplicate the work and show that these and get some genetic analysis on these so-called um, lichenoid reactions. So we, we, we still have the same concept. It still goes round and round, and it's there because people cannot be absolutely certain. But come on, if you're a pathologist, you've got to be able to deal with grey areas and difficulty. And we all have cases that we don't know what the answer is. And you just have to say so. Uh, and you have to say this is you know, possibly a dysplastic lesion. Get the clinical images, get the history. Suggest that the clinicians keep the patient under review for a bit before they discharge them. Um, but I would never use the term lichenoid dysplasia. Dysplasia is a lichenoid. That's life. Right, thanks, Eddie. Basic, uh, again, a question from uh, Bashkar. Uh, <laughs> exfoliative cytology. Okay, so we don't use any exfoliative cytology here. I have looked at brush biopsy, um, and that certainly gives you a good sample. And I think if your exfoliative cytology is taken with a really good scrape, um, you can get quite a good sample. Uh, yes, you can have one, but you'll have to design it. I can't help you with that. Um, I, the, the problem with all, anything that looks at the surface layers is architectural dysplasia. If you have dysplasia, which is limited in terms of its cytological features, you won't be able to detect it. And you will... Uh, not be able to detect uh, an architectural differentiated dysplasia that is early premature keratinization. However deep you go in the epithelium, you're just going to get premature keratinizing cells with normal looking nuclei. So uh, 
I think that's going to be a difficult one. Some, it, it again, the value of exfoliative cytology and cytology depends on where you work and how your clinicians work. It's a good, quick, rapid screening test, but it's never going to give you a specific classification as good as a dysplasia grading. Uh, but I cannot help you with designing that. Good luck. Yeah, I, I, I feel very strongly about it. I try to get our clinicians to stay away from that. Uh, anyone. Uh, it's easy accessible and there's no need to go for that. Right, no. there's one from uh, Kelly. Kelly, yes, Kelly, good question. I said, right, so the difficulty here is that after the WHO classification comes out, they then progress into the other phases and it took about two years to get the previous for instance, oropharyngeal HPV cancer information out into TNM and out into uh, CAP staging protocols. So uh, the IARC have already started the process for writing the, uh, the ICCR data sets for uh, the new classification. Um, and I think that it is difficult when these all disagree because many countries have agreed that they will align with ICCR and that was working quite well for most data sets until four or five years ago when we started to get some splittists breaking off uh, who didn't like certain things. Um, I don't think that you should stage dysplasia. Um, it's not a carcinoma and it's not a carcinoma in situ, it's a dysplasia, you grade it. You're not giving a prediction, you're just giving a statistical risk of it going malignant. And even if you call it severe dysplasia, it probably still won't go malignant. So why on earth should we give it a cancer stage? I think if, if carcinoma in situ were abolished, it would simplify these problems. Uh, and I hate putting PTIS on staging when, disp when dysplasia patients go through uh, our equivalent of cancer boards and things, because it's not really, uh, it's not relevant. Thank you. Anybody for a last quick question in chat? I don't know if somebody directs something directly to you. I don't see anything, but they can tack it on the bottom again if they want to. Okay. If that's okay, case, so Eddie, uh, well, again, from my side, thank you. I mean, uh, we've ended this invited series really on a high. I mean, all of us are looking at epithelial dysplasias and so on. And thank you for explaining for us to link what we see with what is going on uh, and make us help us to better understand, because you need to understand uh, what the disease is in order to give an opinion, to give a better opinion, because an opinion is a communication uh, to the clinicians, to direct uh, management and treatment. And thank you for the work that you've done up to now, still going to do, and for the time in uh, giving us this fantastic lecture. Really much appreciated. Thank you very much. It's a delight to talk to everybody and nice to see lots of names I recognize online and uh, hope to see everybody soon, maybe uh, IOP Taiwan next year or the year after, maybe in Mexico or wherever we can get together and talk in person, which is always uh, much more rewarding. Yeah. And to all the colleagues, thank you again for attending in masses from all over the globe. We really appreciate your support and we're going to carry on with this early next year. Uh, for those taking a break, enjoy that and we see you soon. Thanks. And Eddie, thanks again. Much appreciated. Good night, everyone.